right, right now, um, at, who are vying to become the next governor of Illinois. And why is this election cycle so important? Bruce Rauner. <laughs> Trump-like right wing is intent on destroying labor, bankrupting our state, and shielding rich people from paying their fair share. Like JB. Like JB. Second opening. When they're given a question, they have one minute to respond. Somebody mentions another candidate in their answer. That person will have 30 seconds to respond. A rule that we are would like and we are going to enforce. We would really appreciate everybody not making, you know, yelling and screaming, saying, "Oh yes, I like this answer. I don't like that answer," and like we can hold our applause to the end. <laughs> that is something that in forums across this, uh, like forums I've always forums or other forms in the past has been the rule, and we really want that to be the rule today. Um, our moderator for today, as everybody knows, is um, the premier political reporter in Illinois, our good friend, Marianne Ahern. One other thing, there are, there are seats in the back of the rooms, because we do have overflow rooms where there's, it's up on the monitor, you'll see just as well as standing in the back. And with that, we're
we're going to bring up the candidates, and we're hoping that the men sitting on the right will move the state to the left. So, with that, one of the things um, um, we want to thank Canon TV for covering this event live today. If you know of somebody who couldn't make it, you can certainly send them a text. Um, and that's channel, cable channel 27, or they can watch it online, online at cantv.org or at the Our Revolution Illinois Facebook page, because our many gatherings across the doing are watching this live. So at any rate, without further ado, we'll bring up the candidates, and um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Ann, and thank you, Karen and Clem, for your introduction today. Uh, I'm Bob Diver. I'm a Democratic candidate for governor from Southern Illinois, from the Edwardsville area. Now, for 38 years, I've been involved in public education, 28 as a teacher, the last 10 as regional superintendent, which is an elected office in Madison County. 22 years, an official at all levels, from city council to the township, two terms on the county board, prior to being a countywide elected official. Now let me tell you, during my time of being in those precious years of my life, I was president of a local of, with IEA. So being in a union house, I have utmost respect for uh, Karen Lewis and the Chicago Teachers Union. I was asked a question. Your time is up. Thank you. Theo Hardman, I'm running for governor. This is my second run for governor. In 2014, we secured close to 30 percent of the state vote. My running mate, her name is Patricia Avery. She's a former president of the NAACP in Champaign-Urbana and a former Champaign County Commissioner. I have a 2020 plan, which represents a perfect vision for all the people here in Illinois. I'm a different type of candidate. I need your support, and we can take on anybody in this race and win this Democratic primary, and then go on to defeat. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you, Karen, and CTU for your hospitality and for the important work you do. And thank you for the turnout. So why, why, are we, why are we all here? We're here because this is a unique generational opportunity to determine the future of the Democratic Party and the state of Illinois. And this is a chance for us to decide, are we going to listen to the insiders and let it be all about billionaires again? Or are we going to move to make transformational change we've needed for so long? I cannot wait for this conversation about the changes we need in the state of Illinois. Thank you. I'm Chris Kennedy. You say you want a revolution. Well, I want one too. I want to stop the ethnic gentrification of the city of Chicago. I want to stop the economic gentrification of the state of Illinois. I want to end the despair in so many of our communities that are pushing people into the racist hands of Donald Trump. All of it is related to a broken government based on a corrupt property tax system 
instead of a progressive graduated income tax. I want to join your revolution, and I want you to join mine. J.B. Kritzker, and I want to wait to all of you. This race isn't about money, it's about values. It's about progressive democratic values. It's about standing up for an agenda, and I will bring it to Springfield, a progressive income tax, a $15 minimum wage, making sure that we legalize marijuana in the state tax it. Universal health care and passing the ERA once and for all. Let's put Springfield back on the side of working families. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is. What are you going to do? This, this election is about race and class and geography. Donald Trump and Bruce Rauner are racists. But what we have to recognize is what they do to keep us all divided. They pit poor white people against poor black and brown people and they drive wedges between communities and people over and over again so that the only remaining group that's left is their political base. And the only way to do that, and to fight that, is to unite around a progressive agenda that brings the state together. Thank you. My name is Alex Paterakis. I'm a civil engineer and small business owner. I can tell you what progressive values um, these people we have an individual that condemns a mansion and decides that for the tax break, we have an individual that wanted pension reform to strip people of their pensions. We have individuals that vote with Ron Emanuel 95% of the time. And everyone up here asks for a 15 uh, minimum wage, but does not treat their interns, doesn't pay their interns. I give my employees $14 an hour, I hire 50% veterans and I give uh, part-time employees health care. That's true progressive reform, and I look forward to talking to you again on how we can be successful. Thank you. Well, I think, actually, Alex started where we thought. A lot of folks want to hear from the very beginning. Let's do this in a, in a show of hands. How many of you support a $15 minimum wage? That's what I want. All right. So you support it, I'm assuming, with even cost of living adjustments. Now the question is, how does the state get there? The state get there. All right. You can. What's going on? How about that? All right. I'm getting better. The thing is, Michael Madigan has allowed the $15 an hour minimum committee. <laughs> the legislation is out of committee, but passing a $15 an hour minimum wage is not enough in the state house. It's about guaranteeing paid sick leave, it's about fair scheduling, it's paid family for maternity leave and paternity leave. All of these things together is what helps working families. We have to stop pretending that a $15 an hour minimum wage is getting people rich. It's about all of those things together that supports working families, and I've worked on that in city council. I led the effort to guarantee paid sick leave to half a million Chicagoans. I worked on the minimum wage task force to raise the $13 an hour minimum wage in Chicago, and we know that's not enough. It's $15 an hour as a base leave, plus fair scheduling, plus protections from wage theft, plus paid family leave. Those things combined is what helps working families. So let's stop acting like $15 an hour is enough. Thank you. To. You mentioned that there, I'm, I'm assuming someone here on the stage is not uh, paying their interns. Could you be specific? <laughs> well, you can look at any campaign site. You know uh, all expenditures are on campaign sites. So I take it on a ton. Everyone to take a look at every, who is funding these campaigns and who they are paying. 
we have an issue. Everyone talks about $15 minimum wage. What we need to do is small business reform. We don't invest enough in individuals. What I would do is the first two years, I would make sure that small businesses and manufacturing high tech can come here and not pay taxes with the investment that they're going to be here for the next two to three years. That brings small business growth. If we can give tax cuts to small businesses and people that are hiring, they can afford to hire more people at higher wages. It alleviates that burden. So that's what we need to do. And unfortunately, we give these corporations massive tax cuts. They say they're gonna bring 40, 50, 60,000 jobs, and what ends up happening, they do not. And if we give corporations that benefit, they better bring those jobs here or else pay a fine. Chris? Well, I think the state would go there. I think it would go there quickly. The old days, policy, well, that, was, that was what was being driven by politics. Now we're using policy as when you have leadership that's destroying our state, that's preserving a property tax system for funding our schools and our government, that's corrupt, where they're making money on that system, they need, they need issues like a $15 minimum wage that they can promise in the next election. Because if left to be judged by their own activity, by the way they're destroying our communities, by the way they're profiting on the fact that our schools are underfunded, if we judge them alone on that, we would remove them from office. So instead of passing great laws like that, they dangle them in front of us. Oh, in the next election, we'll give that to you. And that's how they preserve their jobs, and it needs to end. JV, there are going to be jobs. Obviously, folks in this room support it, but there's been a long argument that it is a job killer. How do you answer that question, that raising the minimum wage is not a job killer? Proven to not be a job killer. In fact, when you put $15 an hour in people's hands, guess what? The people who get it are spending it. That, honestly, that is economic development. We ought to be doing that. Now, here's a really important fact, though, that we don't just need to raise the minimum wage to $15. I'm looking at the right place. <laughs> uh, we don't just need a $15 minimum wage in this state. We, in addition to that, we also need to create jobs because that's how we're gonna raise wages beyond $15, and that's what people want. We need to make sure people are getting the skills of vocational training in high schools so they can get the jobs that pay more than $15. But we gotta start with a $15 minimum wage. Superintendent Diver, do you think folks, uh, is this an issue that crosses downstate as well as Chicago at the $15? Well, it's no secret that uh, the minimum wage going to $15 downstate is the biggest level of the minimum wage today, which is $8.75. So I propose the minimum wage is ramped up over a period of years to $15, like within three years. But there's also got to be, I appreciate that you bring up the COLA factor. That I've said when we pass this minimum wage, and there has to be a cost of living adjustment in it because that's what gets people. Their power bills go up, their insurance goes up, one, one entity after another goes up, and they're making a bare minimum wage. You cannot live on $8.75, you can't live on $10 an hour, much less $15 today because of increased cost of living. So there has to be a pull of factor tied to the minimum wage, and that's what I've advocated. I'm for a $15 an hour minimum wage, but I don't believe we can get there tomorrow, but I do think we could be at $10 an hour tomorrow morning. Mr. Hartman, you want to weigh in as well. Well, you know, increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour is a no-brainer. We must support the financial transaction tax, which is called mercantile change, and then we can use the money from that particular tax to help fund some of the smaller businesses out here across Illinois with special incentives so they can stay in business. When I become governor, I plan to sign the minimum wage bill immediately. That will be one of the first bills that T.O. Harden and Patricia Avery will sign that bill. Okay, it's a no-brainer in my opinion. Thank you, everybody. Plus, I'm the only candidate running for governor that worked for minimum wage many, many years ago. So I understand it firsthand. I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Senator Bess, you are a member of the General Assembly. This is not going to go over well with everyone. How will you get that? Well, let's remember that we've come a long way, that we put a $15 minimum wage bill on Bruce Rauner's desk this spring, and he vetoed it. Now, let's think about what that looks like compared to where we were five years ago. When we were organizing for the fight for 15 five years ago, we got laughed out of the room. And what changed? 
It wasn't mostly in the Capitol building. It was here. It was us. It was movement building. It was marching. It was demanding. It was building political power and not taking no for an answer and not taking eye rolling for an answer either. That transformed the political environment, which is how we found the majorities needed to put those bills on Bruce Rauner's desk. But get this, you're exactly right, Marianne. The forces that don't want to pay that wage are more than happy to say, as long as Bruce Rauner's there, sure, you guys go have your fun, pass your $15, and as soon as we have me as governor excited to sign that bill, they're going to be fighting back. And so we have to keep organizing, we have to keep building power, we have to hold every single elected official accountable and make sure in every legislative campaign we put everyone on the record before the election, not after. Thank you. Let's talk about the tradition. That has certainly been a hot issue for the progressives like Bernie Sanders. What do you all, let's see our show of hands on that one. Uh, does everyone favor some kind of free college tuition? Please raise your hand if you do. Thank you. All right, New York is offering students attending public colleges and universities for families making up to $125,000 a year. Do you agree with that income cutoff? Do you agree with all four years of free college tuition? And where does that money come from? Could we start, please, with Mr. Pritzker? Sure. Well, first of all, we absolutely need to put ourselves on a path for a free college for every kid in Illinois who cannot now afford to go to college. I do not think to my children, to be clear. Um, it is important, however, that we, that we look at the funding source, because it is going to be a progressive income tax that does this for us. It, the priorities that we have in this state, which ought to be, education ought to be right up there, it's education, healthcare, jobs, those are the three things that I'm going to be focusing on. But it's, it's college education, making sure that you're not strapped with debt for the rest of your life. That's what we ought to be focusing on. And vocational training for those kids who choose not to go to college, because there will be those who choose that. But we've got to make sure that we're setting a standard here that every kid, every kid has the ability to go to college and not get strapped for the rest What's of the life. What's the income cutoff? With debt. To, as far as I'm concerned, middle class and people striving to get to the middle class are the people who should be eligible. And are you talking all four years? I, if it, we have got to work ourselves toward four years. There's a bill, by the way, that's been introduced. Will Gazzardi and Christian Mitchell um, have introduced a bill, that 1316, HB 1316, which would, in fact, begin this process of moving toward free college. All right. Senator Biss, where do you stand? What's your income cutoff all four years? How, how are you going to pay for this? Here's why. When we create programs that only apply to some, eventually those programs get eroded. Eventually the powers that be that don't want to pay their share are able to chip away and chip away and chip away. And therefore we need to have universal college because we have an economy that requires that access to create equal opportunity for a middle class life for all. So the question then is how do you pay for it? Of course we need a progressive income tax. I've been fighting for that since before I was running for office, but that's not going to be enough either. I'm a co-sponsor of the financial transactions tax, the LaSalle Street tax, to put a small tax on trades at the Board of Trade and the Mercantile Exchange. I passed out of the Illinois Senate a bill to close the carry interest loophole here on the state level because we obviously can't trust the folks in Washington to do it for us. There are tools to find the revenue if we have the courage to go where the money is. There are Thank people you. who want to tell us we can't afford it. The money's there. Alderman Pouar, do you have any more? Please go to applause, please. Alderman Pouar, where do you stand on free college tuition? Well, let me see if I can get this mic thing right this time. Uh, I don't think there should be any cutoff. But I'm the son of immigrants, and for me, the American dream didn't mean my parents were able to pay for my college or graduate school. I always joke, my wife always jokes up about marrying me and my student loans. <laughs> I brought $250,000 in student loans with me to our marriage. As an alderman, I make $108,000 a year, which is a damn good salary. But if something happens to our family, just know that half of my take home right now goes to pay for my student loans. And we are solidly middle class, and no one should feel sorry for us. So the idea that college has put us in a place but we ask young people to do the right thing, go to the best schools, and then they are in comfort for the rest of their life is insane. So you want a shot at the middle class? Free college is the only way to do it. And How do you pay for it, Alderman? Nothing's free. Yeah, of course nothing's free. But just know that we live in the fifth largest economy in the country. It is $700 billion in terms of our GDP. Let's stop acting like we're broke and there isn't enough money to pay for it. A progressive income tax, legalize, regulate, tax marijuana, close corporate loopholes, pass 
seven who basically carried interest bill. There's enough money. We can get this done. Where do you stand on college tuition? I believe I've heard you say not necessarily all four years. I, I have said that. I think it would be a great goal to get there. But immediately, we ought to provide community college, free community college to everybody in our state. We ought to means test it as, as uh, other states do. I earn between one hundred and twenty and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. I would raise all of the standards at the community at the uh, uh, public colleges across the state. Raise them from about sixty-five thousand dollars a year up to that one twenty to one fifty number. And I just I just say to yourselves, look. If Kentucky can do it, we can do it. <laughs> the reason we don't do it is we pay for our, a lot of our community colleges with property taxes. If you make money in the property tax business, you want to preserve a property tax funded system for all of our government. If we got rid of the, we took the dirty money out of politics, we'd get the dirty politicians out of government. <laughs> Well, I, I strongly support uh, free community college, and I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you how we get there. Right now, community colleges were designed to be paid a third, a third, a third, a third by property taxes, a third by state resources, and realistically today, we could pick up that other one third as a state, and we could make it possible. That is a realistic goal immediately for free community college, and that answers a big question. That gives a student a start in college, it also provides those opportunities where we want to provide career and technical training for an individual who may not be looking at going on to a four-year institution. So there is a two plus two win there. That person also, if you graduate from a, an Illinois Community College, when you go to a state university, you automatically have junior status. So then I will invest in those people who are successful with state money as they become juniors and seniors and, and uphold monetary assistance programs for MAP. Thank you. Mr. Katerakis, where are you? The number is 5.8 million jobs right now are available in the United States. Most much. I want to make sure that high school students, I went to, I was lucky, I went to a high school, Adelaide Stevenson High School, we had all the money that we could ever have at high, and I want all high schools the first have it so kids can make the right to cho right choices. I was lied to. I was told, you need to go to college, Alex, and once you did, you're going to graduate and you're going to have a great job. That was a fallacy, it was a lie. And we need to make sure that kids that want to go to vocational schools, to follow the opportunity, maybe not their passion, but follow the opportunity. But with that, I say community college right now, today, should be free. We have plenty. College of DuPage, one of the highest rated uh, community colleges in the nation, the College of Lake County. All these colleges are solid educations. And when we get to the K, when we get to uh, higher ed, so into the four year degrees, we should be working towards that and using the pay for it would be the legalization of cannabis and new net new revenues with gambling only in O'Hare Airport. Thank you, Mr. Harden. Yeah, I definitely support uh, free college tuition up until the bachelor's degree level. I currently also serve as an adjunct professor at North Park University and Governor, Governor State University. I see the struggles young people have, so I wouldn't put a cap on it as far as income. All kids deserve a good education. <laughs> For those who do, do not know, in Chicago right now, you have free college at city colleges if you have a certain GPA. So that's happening in Chicago right now. So I do support funding free college education to the bachelor's degree level. Once you work on your master's degree, that's something that you gotta kinda get support for. And he came in once again at the student loan some years ago. So I know the hardships of paying back the student loan. We, we need to make it free across the board. Thank All you. All right. Sticking with the education theme, the Illinois General Assembly recently approved a scholarship tax credit program for private schools. If you are elected governor, what happens to this program, Senator Miss? That irresponsible, immoral voucher program. That was a red line for me I was not prepared to cross. My running mate, Letisa Wallace, did the same thing in the House. And when I'm governor, we're going to repeal it. But when I'm governor, we're also going to finally fund our public schools properly. I'm looking at row, and I'm thinking back to the time that I spent with Dan in 2005 and 2006 in a little room in the IFT uh, 
uh, meet, meeting space up in Skokie with Ilya Shaman, trying to figure out then how to reform our school funding system. I have been trying to organize in communities around this issue, not for a few years, but for over a decade, because the way that we fund our schools in Illinois is unjust and immoral and unacceptable, and it's because the way that we get our tax money is also immoral and unjust and unacceptable. We are going to organize a giant movement, repeal the flat tax provision of the Constitution, bring in adequate revenue to fund schools properly on the state level, and finally have a reasonable property tax system as well. Mr. Prince, where do you stand on this new voucher scholarship tax credit program for private schools? Well, remember, they walked into a room with SB1. SB1. Everybody remember that this is the funding formula fix. They walked into a room, a dark room apparently, uh, with just the leadership, and somehow they came out siphoning off money to go to, you know, frankly, very wealthy people and for private uh, schools. And this isn't right. We not only need to keep the public money in public schools, but we need to significantly improve the funding for education all across this state. That's why we need the progressive income tax. It, it, we literally have been underfunding every single year. Illinois is last in the nation, last in state funding for education, last. That's why property taxes are high. That's why we need a progressive income tax. I mean, we basically fund half of what other states fund. That's wrong and immoral, and I'll change it when I'm going. Okay, but the question was, what happens to the scholarship tax credit? It, so not only did my running mate also uh, vote against this bill, um, and I came out against it too, but also I pledged to repeal exactly that provision when I become governor. All right. Superintendent Diver, where do you stand? I've always, I've always opposed uh, tax credits for uh, private or parochial institutions. I would appeal it immediately, repeal it. Uh, I, I said this, uh, you can pass progressive income tax, uh, you can uh, go through and get all sorts of new revenue. As long as it goes to the general fund, there's one issue that's at stake. And that issue is, is you have to pass an education approach bill by March 31st, not August 31st. You gotta put education funding at the top of the list, not at the back. You can pass another lottery, you can expand gambling, you can do anything you want, but as long as it all goes into general revenue, and you fund education last, you're always going to get what you've always got if you always do what you've always done. Chris, Mr. Kennedy, where do you stand on the voucher scholarship tax credit program? I oppose it, I repeal it, and I uh, point to the Constitution of the state of Illinois. That thing is a complete violation of Article 10, Paragraph 3. It's clear language, and what we did violated our Constitution. But the fellows who did it, the people who were in charge, they were clever. They made the whole thing, you challenge any one part of that funding bill, the whole thing collapses. They've silenced all of us once again, and that needs to end in our state. Some of you have brought up already, Senator Biss, you did, the, the funding element, I think Mr. Brisker did as well. The new education funding formula, it's called an evidence base to income students. But the state did put the bare minimum of new dollars into the formula. So it's still the same old issue of those who live in wealthier neighborhoods will receive more money. What's the solution? Superintendent Diver. There's three factors that have to be taken out of the school funding formula if you really want to get it right. You've got to take EAD out, you got to take TIF districts out, and you have to take PTEL out. And until you take that out, you're going to get the same thing. That was the factor when they were trying to pass SB1. They moved it on to 1947. If you read about passing those bills, you'll see those three factors that come up. You've got to move funding of education away from property taxes. I said that in 1992. I said that you've got to have a designated tax for education. It's got to be a designated fund. It's got to be attached to your IL 1040, and that's how you fix funding public education in the state of Illinois. Mr. Hartman. Yeah, right now, the funding for schools in Illinois is very, very important. It should definitely be a priority, but the way to fund it is in the progressive tax as well. The Illinois state lottery really needs to be looked at a little closer because just last year, I think they put in $6 million, $696 million in a general education fund. When we talk about funding schools, we have to think about the entire state, but the money should come out of the progressive tax funds right now. But you cannot get a progressive tax people in Illinois until you change the Constitution, so that may not happen until 2020. But education will be a priority in the Heart of the Navy campaign. All right. All of them are. 
the thing about education equity, or equity in general, is equity does not mean equal. Equity means spending more money where it's needed. And if we want true education equity, then we must all recognize that this is really just about money. We don't spend enough money in our public schools. That's it. It's not accountability, it's not different teachers' contracts, it's not the other garbage. It just is about money because we do not bring in enough money to pay for public schools. Number two. Now, I just wanted to say, I would repeal the private education tax program, but also, we need to get rid of the Illinois State Charter Commission, which undermines public schools. Which undermines public schools. If you want true equity, it's not just getting more money into the system, but it's recognizing you need to spend more money where it's more needed, where it's most needed, and also knowing that I mean, if I keep getting more dollars, that's not equity. It's spending money where it's needed and getting the revenue to support it. Thanks. Senator Biss, you voted for the education funding bill, but if there's still this lag between you did not vote for the education funding bill, okay, explain that. What, how would you fix it to make sure that there is this evidence-based model as the theory of the bill? Uh, I voted against it specifically because of the voucher program. I'm proud of that vote. Right. I would do that about eight days a week. Um, but the rest of what's in the bill was a small and important step in the right direction. Step in the right direction. We need to repeal the flat tax provision of the Constitution, bring in adequate revenue in a fair way, and then fundamentally transform our school funding system and property taxes as a result. Now, the amazing thing is that all of us are saying really similar things. The question I would ask is, where have you been? I started running for state representative in 2007 and frankly, an affluent district that wanted to hear none of this stuff, not a word of it, saying all of it, banging on doors saying we need a progressive income tax, banging on doors saying we need to reform our school funding formula. I voted for school funding reform years ago, took a lot of political heat at home to do. We need not just a person to say the right thing now, we need to build a movement to demand these reforms because the status quo is helping some people and they're not gonna take what we need unless we force it on them. All right, let's, some of you have brought it up already, but let's get a reading on the financial transaction tax. Mr. Pritzker, where do you stand? Some call it the LaSalle Street tax. Is this the route to a progressive tax system? So, I'm opposed to the LaSalle Street tax because I believe that we will ultimately lose revenue and lose jobs as a result of it. Why? Because. Here's what's happened. You know, 10, 15 years ago, there were people on the floors of these exchanges who were hand signaling each other uh, to make trades. Today, there are servers, okay? And these servers, by the way, are leased. So the transactions that are taking place are not taking place on the floor. They're taking place on a server. That server could reside anywhere. If we impose a transaction tax that's single state, it is highly likely that those businesses will simply get up and move to another state that has internet trunk lines. So instead, if you're going to have a transaction tax, it has to be a federal tax. There are other ways for us to raise revenue in the state. I believe a progressive income tax allows us not only to impose that tax upon the wealthy people who are traders who live in Illinois, but also upon the corporations themselves that are the exchanges that are doing business here. Mr. Kennedy, where are you on the LaSalle Street tax? Well, I'd point out that most of the trading is done on Blacker Drive, not LaSalle Street. <laughs> Let's just start there. <laughs> Wherever it's taxed. You know, what matters if you get a regulated you ought to know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I would say this. You know, I like to promise everybody rainbows and swing sets in their backyard. They're not going to pay for anything. The idea that we're going to go after LaSalle Street and somehow tax all of them. It's just a fallacy. They'll move that money around faster than we can regulate it. The fact is, you can order from Amazon Prime. They know, they know the router in your apartment or your office. They know your address, and then they're delivering it to your address. If you live in Cook County, you don't have to pay Cook County taxes. We can't freight tax Amazon. We're never going to tax the Merck and the board. Alderman Poir, where do you stand on that? Yep. The LaSalle Street Financial Transaction Tax, Wacker Tax, whatever it's called. Where are you? So I've been pretty clear in my position on this, including what I answered on the editorial board questionnaires when I ran for re-election as well. The thing about taxing behavior is if you just have to adjust based on 
whether they change their behaviors, like taxing cigarettes. If you tax cigarettes, people smoke less. That's a desired result. If you want to tax high-speed trading to reduce speculative trading or flash trading, you tax it. I've been on the record from the beginning that if you want to get at the financial services industry, then let's do what New York City does. They have a corporate aid level, which I've proposed, and they also have a specialized tax for the financial services sector. Because I think there's more money to be taxed on income than there is on behavior. That's where I've always stood, and I think that's where we should go. Mr. Hart. Business transaction tax. That tax can bring in $3 million of new revenue in the state of Illinois, which a progressive tax can bring in $2 million of new revenue. With a 40 year Hardman and Avery administration, that's $5 million of new income here in the state of Illinois. We need to take a serious look at House Bill 453, and I will sign that bill immediately because the rich people, the corporate people, and it's not a slight in nobody, I just want to make that clear. The reality is that rich people are not prepared at fair share of taxes, and the business transaction tax is only a fourth of a quarter, it's not even a big tax. So the businesses uh, choose to leave because we impose a small tax on them, we would have to really have a conversation. As your governor, I plan to leave that charge. Secretary, I guess you want to weigh in. So pretty much in Illinois, we're taxed on everything. And unfortunately, most of the taxes that we have are on the middle class and the poor. Soda taxes. I don't like those because what do they do? They uh, attack the poor. Um, we have a income tax that's flat across everyone, the rich don't pay any more than the people that have, uh, that have taken more. We have a bag tax, we have high property taxes, we have high sales taxes. All those things negatively affect the poor and the middle class. Any new taxes that we raise, because here's an example, because here's an example. We talk about education funding. The lottery was supposed to pay for education funding. Anybody know how much uh, goes to education funding? 24%. It ends up in the general fund, and any new taxes need to be regulated because politicians, unfortunately, don't keep their word. They say they're going to raise money just to raise money to fix things, and those things never get fixed. Thank you. Mr. Driver, I don't think we heard from you. I, I want to the record said I would support the financial transaction tax. Do I think it's reality? No. And I'll tell you why. Because I sat in the House of Pro meeting one night uh, next to the CEO of CME Group. He's asking for a $10 million tax break. I was asking for a paycheck for myself. And 90 other people in the state of Illinois hadn't been paid in six months. You know what? He got his tax break. I waited three more months. So, you know, it's like this. There's a reality as to what you think is possible. There's a reality as to what will be. As governor, I wouldn't be counting on that revenue. If it happened, I'd sign it. But it has to be less than a half percent. And Senator Biss, you did bring it up before, but would you like to weigh in one more time? Uh, I, I would. Um, for, I want to make two points. Uh, first of all, Look around at our economy. It is harder and harder to get by. People are finding it more and more difficult to make ends meet. There's a shrinking, vanishing middle class. And yet the numbers say we're richer than we've ever been. What happened? The financial sector has ballooned. And so as the economy has changed, if we want to fund our schools properly, if we want a government that works, we have to change our tax code with it. It's time to tax the financial sector properly, and that means passing the LaSalle Street tax, the Andowacker Street tax, if you prefer. I'm a co-sponsor of that bill in the Senate. But I also want to say that Bob's right. We're not going to pass that tomorrow. We've got to organize around that. We have to build power. We have to work together to demand that out of our legislature. We can't pass the buck. You can say that it should happen in Washington. If that's what you want to do, run for president. You can afford that, too. We need to do it here. I, I want to be clear. Um, thank you for referring to me um, once again as, as wealthy. I, I want to be clear about something. And that's that um, no one up here on stage wears any kind of halo. And Daniel, while I appreciate you calling that out, um, you know you've accepted money from special interests. You've accepted money from. <laughs> And, and this is, a, and, right. and I want to be clear though that, that you know that, that I do not believe that they're buying you in any way whatsoever. I believe that they believe in you, and that's why they wrote check. Um, and, and no, I, I, I'm standing up here telling you exactly what it is that I believe. And the one thing you will know about me is that if you elect me, everything that I have told you that I will do is exactly what I will do. There's nobody calling me in the middle of the night telling me I can't do it. There's no, no special interest that will have funded me that will call me in the middle of the night and say, I'm sorry, we're not funding you for the next election. All right, Senator Jason Call. I'm incredibly proud of the 
way that we have funded our campaign. I am incredibly proud of the thousands of people who have donated to our campaign. I am proud of the fact that though frankly the establishment thinks I have no chance, and despite the fact that I live a middle class life, we have been able to outraise everybody else on this stage, unless you count money people put into their own campaigns, for two quarters running. That's because of the people of Illinois coming together to build a movement to change our state, and that's the only way we're going to accomplish what this state needs. All right, thank you. A couple of individual questions. Let's start with Alderman Pawar. As a progressive candidate, not a member of the Progressive Caucus for the Chicago City Council. Love that question. <laughs> so I think I've been able to get a lot of done in City Council, work on progressive issues. Truthfully, I know my faults are. I tend to work alone. I don't always build coalitions. But I think that's always been able to afford me the ability to actually pass legislation. I think there has been a lot of personality conflicts between me and the Progressive Caucus, and I own that. Some of it started by me, and some things that are internal. And I don't think it makes sense to air that. I respect them, and I'll tell you one thing. I worked on the task force to pass $13 minimum wage, and I led the effort on paid sick leave, but they were also the ones leading out there and organizing around that. So I think we've all played our roles. I'm proud of the work that I've done. I'm proud of my record. There have been some personality issues that came up, and I don't think it makes sense to air that in a public setting, other than to say I respect them. I think they respect me. I'll leave it at that. How do you work then with the state? If, if you are someone who likes to work alone, how will you expand that role from being a city council member to the head of Illinois? What I mean by working alone is I've always been able to cobble together the votes of passion and make an independent budget office or paid sick leave. I got here on my own. I knocked on doors. I knocked on doors with my wife. I have volunteers that help me. I've never been a part of any club, and no establishment figures ever help me. The parties never give me a dime, I've never asked them for a dime. I got here on my own grit and sh sweat equity. <laughs> I own my weaknesses, I always have. But I've been there, always worked hard, and I've outworked people. And that's how our work is governed. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Christopher, do you believe it's appropriate to disconnect the plumbing from what many would consider a mansion to receive a $230,000 tax break? Thank you for asking that question. Uh, here is the, the truth of that, and that is that we began a renovation project on a home, and we decided to stop that project, and at some point in the future after that, we, you know, like 50,000 other people in Cook County every single year, sorry, like Chris Kennedy, like uh, Governor Rauner, um, and others, um, ask for a reassessment of the property's value. Not, not because of that, but just it was a point in which, as you know, we have a very unfair assessment process. We need, and I discovered how flawed it really is. That, in fact, is why we need to get rid of that system, make sure that we've got a formula that really works for assessing properties, and make sure that people are paying their fair share for their properties. That, that's what, what happened in that situation. If there does need to be up to the voters, but I must say that things in the uh, the assessment world in Cook County have not been going that well lately, let's all face it. Um, and across the state, this is not just a, an issue in Cook County, by the way. All across the state, we have got the problem of in poor communities, they are paying the very highest rates, the very highest rates. That is very unfair. I am in favor of more progressive taxes, less regressive taxes. Unfortunately, our property tax system is quite regressive in the state. So, Mr. Kennedy, you brought your name up. You also did receive uh, a tax break at Wolf Point. You have apparently received also a, a tax break on your home. Where, where do you stand? Is that well, well, what, what Mr. Prinsker did and what everybody else has ever appealed their taxes did are two radically different things. We appeal our taxes. He had his house reclassified as uninhabitable. That's a different thing. I've never even heard of it. I've been in real estate 30 years in Chicago. I never knew you could do that thing. That's a little bit serious. That's like a whole other day. But, but you also did receive a tax break. Let's just finish. He did that. Then he says he's in the house next door and he appeals that tax. He says, look, I'm living next to an uninhabitable. 
don't, don't put me in that box. <laughs> Berrios' system is a violation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and he should be taken out of office. I, 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 I must say, by the way, that uh, millions, of dollars of, millions of dollars of tax breaks at Wolf Point taken by Mr. Kennedy um, do qualify, in fact, as tax breaks. So, to, and, and to be clear, our property, by the way, is no longer on that roll. It was a temporary situation that we, in fact, were doing renovations, stopped that, and are beginning to do those renovations again. But you do support Mr. Berrios. No, what I'm suggesting is I'm running for governor, and I believe that the people, Cook County ought to make the decision about who the assessor is of Cook County. I must say, though, things are not going well in terms of assessment of properties, and people who are poor are paying the highest taxes. And Mr. Kennedy, could you clarify, because you did get a tax break at Wolf Point, so there have been... That's not true. Can we please, let's listen. He can explain it. When Wolf Point was a parking lot, it was assessed as a parking lot. When Wolf Point was a development site, it was assessed as a development site. When the Wolf Point was an apartment building, it was assessed as an apartment building. All of those assessments were within the range of their peers. There's no evidence that I got a break outside of what everybody else got. There's no evidence that the taxes paid there were different than any other taxes paid by a similar building, development, or lot anywhere else in the city. It's not true. All right. Appreciate that. Did anyone else want to weigh in on this issue, Mr. Harvin? Only I don't want to tell anybody right now. That's why you should vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> understand all this. We all agree to take the gentleman's way out when we ran for governor, but when we take the gloves out, people are not going to be happy about it. I'm glad to ask these questions, but for far too long, the reason I support a progressive tax is because the rich people have been getting away too long. You only have 17 billionaires living in Illinois. 17. So if the billionaires vote for the billionaires, they will get 17 votes. The 99% of the progressive Democrats, working class people vote for their own, we will win this election by a landslide. That's my comment. Superintendent Diver, did I see that you wanted to weigh in as well? There's something that's really important for middle class people who are property taxpayers, and everybody understands that. I don't care if you're in Cook County or in Madison County where I live. There's a factor called EAV. That's your equalized assessed valuation. Taxpayers have to pay that EAV every time we give an exemption. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's to someone wealthy. I don't care if it's to someone disabled. I don't care if it's to a senior. Every time there is another exemption passed by the General Assembly, those people who have no exemptions pay more. That's the bottom line of property taxes. So if your property, you want your property taxes to never go down, there's one solution. Cut out all the exemptions. Everybody pays less. Senator Biss, did I see the... All right, I have one for you. All right, because you got a good one coming. You recently did drop your initial lieutenant governor pick, Carlos Ramirez Rosa. After backlash... divestment and sanctions will get. And it's inherent opposition of your stance. You did lose support from Congressman Brad Schneider and Jesus Chuy Garcia. What does this say about the consistency of your platform? I'm also really glad you asked that question. I think there's a fair number of people in this room who want to bring that. That was a painful episode. Carlos is a remarkable progressive. I was excited to have Carlos on the ticket because of a number of deeply, deeply shared values around Medicare for all, a $15 minimum wage, and fundamentally transforming our economy so that finally it works for the rest of us. We had a very, very difficult situation that was uh, resulted in a separation. Our shared values on those issues hasn't changed, and I am thrilled to have Latisa Wallace, not just on the ticket, but here today, the most progressive person running for lieutenant governor, someone who shares with me those views about Medicare for All, someone who's fought for a $15 minimum wage, fought to expand childcare. 
That was a difficult situation, but the values that led to that choice are the values that lead to this choice, are the values that have driven my work in government, and are the values that drive this campaign, and most importantly, are the values that will drive our administration. I've heard a couple of different stories of why, you know, that, that one that you didn't ask in the question, or yes, you did. I mean, how, how did this erupt into such a problem, and why wasn't it, if it meant that much to you, then why didn't you know about it ahead of time? Listen, people can have misunderstandings. We had a conversation. He obviously has strongly held views. I have strongly held views. And when those views came under the bright light of a tremendous amount of controversy, we found that we were no longer able to stay together. By the way, on that issue too, we share some important priorities. We share a commitment to justice for Palestinians. We That's share a commitment not. to peace. We share a commitment to human rights. And we share a commitment to a two-state solution. And so on all of these issues, from the economic issues that drive this campaign or the questions of justice, there are important areas of agreement. It's a shame that we weren't able to um, work those out in a way that was satisfactory. But the thing that I think is most crucial is that we have in this, in this ticket a partnership that will allow us to fight, not just vigorously, but successfully for those same core progressive issues. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Kennedy, you had received criticism after an event downstate called Mom and Baby. Uh, you were late to the event, some of them felt, some of the moms that are at the event felt you disagreed. You've also been somewhat reluctant to take reporters' questions unless it's a one-on-one -on -one setting. Do you have what it takes for a high-profile governor's race? I hope so. <laughs> um, as for the mom and baby's uh, interaction, I'd say that the uh, people in Vernon Hills would be shocked to know that they now live in downstate. Sorry. That's Correction. Okay. Um, I mean, truthfully, they were, a number of them were interviewing for jobs with J.B. Prisker, and, and a lot of the criticism came out of that. A job application process. I go to uh, multiple events every day. I've had enormous amount of uh, press exposure. I grew up in a very exposed family, and I'm very comfortable with other people. Uh, I don't. I don't know what you're looking for in terms of an answer, but I'll take you all on one at a time or all at once. Either way. I'm there. Thank you. Right. Mr. Pritzker, I, I know we're going to hear it. There's going to be an ad that's going to have the phone call with you and former Governor Bogoyevich where you spoke to him about possibly receiving the job as Illinois Treasurer. What happened there? And why would you have called him when nearly everyone knew at that point that he was in trouble? Well, I don't think everyone knew, and, uh, but I will say this, that uh, I made that call because there was an opportunity to do public service, and there was the possibility that the treasurer's office w was going to be vacant, and so I had a call, phone call with him. But to be clear, this is a nine-year-old tape that was leaked to the Chicago Tribune, and clearly, um, frankly, it's been used already by the Illinois GOP and by Bruce Rauner. It is clear to me, by the way, about a week after I announced my that, that I was thinking about running, actually. I really didn't announce. My name was in the newspaper. About a week after that, Bruce Reiner started attacking me immediately. I think it's clear to me Bruce Reiner does not want to run against me. So this is part of that effort. Now, uh, in, in my view, you know, it, as you know, if you listen to that tape, every time uh, the Governor Blagojevich brings up anything to do with money, I reject it. Every time. So um, we should stop you know, playing games and using the GOP's endeavor uh, in our primary, and what we should be doing is talking about our priorities for this state and not taking after one another to keep each other up. I have run a positive campaign, you all know that. I have run a positive campaign, and I believe that we ought to be talking about the failings of this governor and not about each other. Thank you. All right. So, people get asked about it a lot now, but I was for it long before it was cool. I was first running for state rep in 2007. When Barack Obama and John Edwards and Hillary Clinton were arguing about three different non-single payer health care plans, and my campaign website says we gotta do single payer. It's the right thing, it's the right answer, it sucks the for-profit private insurance money out of the system, it's the best way to guarantee universal health insurance, and we need to do it here on the state level. 
And anybody who says that we thought of in principle before it, but maybe should happen to Washington instead, should run for president. Call the the bar where you stand on single payer. So I am in support of single payer. If I'm elected, that is something that we will move on. The thing that we have to recognize and the conversation needs to change about health care because single payer health care is pro business because it drives the cost of small businesses down. So if a small business is paying someone $50,000 a year, they're paying $50,000 plus another 40% on top of it. So it costs the employer $70,000 all in. Now, and it depends on whether you're a construction company or a retail operator or what you do. Now imagine if you can spread that risk out over 14 million people. You can increase wages, drive down costs, and create new jobs. The only people who are standing in the way of a conversation around single payer are the insurance companies and private interests. And that means you just gotta take them on and understand that the whole point of government is us leaning on one another to take care of one another. That's the social contract we have, and that is what single payer will do. Mr. Pitarkis. Of course we need single payer, but let's take a look. Well, not a lot of you know that Eric Rahner had opiate addiction. Okay, he went to a Walgreens. He threatened you. Like, uh, what, what does that have to do with this? It's all about mental health. <laughs> and, and with single we need to be on mental health services and criminal justice reform. I don't think the son of someone is appropriate in this discussion. Actually. Oh, it is, because here's why it is, is that someone that was privileged got out and got their first sentence and then got the treatment he needed. Everyone should be able to get that treatment, not just the rich and select few. And with single payer, that helps. It, it helps us fund mental health services. It helps people fight addictions. That's what we need. And it should be the privileged few that get out of prison sentences and also uh, get the help that they need. I'm so glad that Eric Rahner got the help that he needed. But everyone should have that opportunity. Everyone should get that opportunity. And he's doing quite well right now. Everyone should have that. Superintendent Diver. I said yes, I support a single pair, but first and foremost beyond that, I'm for expanding community care outreach. Because in all of our counties, all 102, there are community health centers there. And these community health centers work. And if you don't believe me, if you've ever went to a university health service center, you've used it, you know it works, you know you get feeling better, you know you get medicine free. That's what we need to be doing in this state. I am not worried about the health insurance companies. I'm concerned about health care. I'm concerned about providing health care for the most vulnerable that can't access it. Whether it's a dentist, whether it's a medical doctor, whether it's getting a toothache fixed or having a fungal uh, infection taken care of. So we're not spending Medicaid money going to emergency rooms, but to community health centers getting to take care of. If we get to single payer, fantastic. But we've got to take care of people's health needs now. Mr. Pritzker, is it doable? Is single payer doable? So I'm in favor of a universal health care across the nation and believe that here in Illinois we need to cover everybody. Nobody on the stage has actually put a plan out there for attempting to get there. I have. Uh, it's called Illinois Cares. And the idea here is a public option. You may remember this idea uh, when President Obama introduced um, the Affordable Care Act and it got put aside. We need to have a public option in the state to allow people to access the state's health care system. Um, so the people who are striving to get to the middle class have the ability to get a finally get a health insurance plan, and people who are in the middle class can get a break on their private health insurance costs. It's important for us to focus on how we're going to get from here to there. We can do my plan, which is revolutionary. I mean, there is no it has passed in one other state, but the governor vetoed it in that state. We can do it in this state, and we will make sure that people begin that we begin to put this state on a path toward universal health care. I absolutely support single payer. I support Medicare for all, but it's a federal program and waiting for the feds to come to the rescue in this time may take decades. I think there's a way to go about getting single payer in our state. It really plays off the notion of who opposes it. It's the insurance companies. The only force more powerful than the insurance companies are the large employers. I ran one of the large employers. I know what those insurance companies do. It's not insurance. They raise your premiums every year to cover whatever cost they didn't cover a year before. 
I'm not talking about the standard increases. I'm talking about made goods from the year before. They're simply shuffling paper. We should treat them as such. Buying together the biggest employers in our state, create one pool for all of them, and use that pool like the Canadians do to drive down the cost of medicine, to drive down the cost of health care, to allow a public option so the state can step in to that pool and cover everyone. Thank you. Let's talk about Speaker Mike Batty. Some say he has more power than the other. What's your relationship like with the Speaker? Is he someone that you turn to for advice and counsel? If not, how will you get anything accomplished? Mr. Harvick? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to answer the single payer health care question. But well, well, not every reason to answer the same no, question. No, I understand, but I do support single payer health care, all right? Now, as far as Mike Madigan, we need a governor that's going to stand up to Mike Madigan and Romney Madigan, okay? If we don't get a governor that's going to stand up to politics as usual in here in Illinois, we're going to fix the same problems over and over again. But how will you right? get anything accomplished? Well, I don't know. Once I become the governor, I believe Mike Madigan will retire personally, because I don't know if he wants to deal with a guy like me. But since I know he'll be in there, this is the thing. We have to work with him and deal with the policies down there. I would have to work with Mike Madigan, but I plan to go on the record today to let you know I'm one of the best progressive candidates running for governor that will have to work with the powers that be to get the job done. But I'm not going to fake with the audience. Romney Madigan needs to go, Mike Madigan needs to go, and anybody that's been supported by those, those type of people, they don't need to be running for governor. How you going to stand up to Trump if you won't stand up to Romney Madigan? Talk about it. Yeah. Can we hold the applause, please? Senator Biss, where do you stand? What's your relationship like with the speaker, and, and what happens if you are the governor and you have to meet with the speaker? Mike Madigan's been speaker for way too long. He's too powerful. That power has held the state of Illinois back. It's held the progressive movement back. It's held the Democratic Party back. One of the first things I did after I got elected was put in a term limit on leader's proposal so you can't serve a speaker for more than a decade. By the way, if he had his way, I wouldn't have been elected in the first place in 2010. If he has his way now, I won't get elected governor either. He won't have his way that time either. It's the good news. But here's the thing. I'm from a totally different wing of the Democratic Party than Mike Madigan, but I've also got more than 80 bills signed into law, passing key progressive priorities, things that people didn't think were going to happen, things that Mike Madigan didn't originally want to see get done. How did I do that? It's not me. It's us working together. The way to move Mike Madigan is the way to move any politician, which is to build movement-based power so they have no choice but to follow. That's what this campaign is about. That's how this campaign is going to allow us to win. But way more importantly, that's how this campaign is going to allow us to do transformational things in the Illinois General Assembly, even though Mike Madigan is there. Thank you. The biggest mistake I made in politics, in the left progressive caucus, I made it about personalities. I learned my lesson. Because you can never make it about any one individual person. And all we do is talk about Mike Madigan. You simply just reinforce the fact that he's somehow more powerful than everybody else. Now, on city council, when I passed legislation to make sure that we have one inspector general, I knew who was working against me. Because someone who had been in office for 40 years, and other folks who had been in office for 20 and 30 years. But if you watch what I said on TV or when I was giving interviews, I never made it about them. Because if I made it about them, I'm reinforcing their power. What I did is I outworked them, and I worked the city council with the votes, and we moved major pieces of legislation. Now, ask them, Mike Madigan, I don't know him. He's never done anything for me. I've never asked him for anything. Like I said, I got here on my own by knocking on doors and with the strength of my community. And that's what I'm up here doing. I have no interest in making this about personalities or making about one boogeyman. Mr. Prince, what's your relationship with the Yeah. So, first thing I'd like to say is that, uh, remember, this is a GOP or Republican talking point. Ooh. Every single candidate that's up here, when they announced, the man Pawar was first, they, he announced for governor, and the GOP put out a press release and said he's a stooge of Mike Madigan. And then uh, next was Chris Kennedy, he's a stooge of Mike Madigan. Next was uh, uh, Senator Biss, um, he's a stooge of Mike Madigan. Every single one, it's like a mad lib with them. They just fill in the name. You're a stooge of Mike Madigan. This is the Republicans talking point about Democrats. Now, let me be clear. I have spent a lifetime getting things done for people across the state of Illinois, real things. Um, 230,000 kids who get school breakfast every single day 
uh, that they go to school because I helped to expand President Obama's program uh, called No Kid Hungry. There are thousands of kids who get preschool and child care in this state because of the work that I've done. And there are more than 60,000 kids every single year that learn to fight bigotry and hatred and intolerance because I helped to put What's your relationship that. like with the speaker? I'm explaining to you that I am an independent. I am somebody who will go to Springfield, who will stand up on the values that I am espousing during this campaign. And I want to be clear, you walk into that room, you don't get to choose. Nobody on this stage gets to choose who the speaker or the president of the Senate is. They get chosen in their district, they get chosen by the fellow members. Um, uh, one of whom voted for Speaker Madigan on the stage. Um, they get voted, they get chosen by their fellow members, and then, and then you get to walk in as governor and you deal with whoever that is. That could be a Republican, by the way. Uh, whoever it is. So you have to walk in on the strength of your values and what it is that you ran your campaign on, and that is why we'll get a progressive income tax under me, because I am completely independent. You still didn't really answer the question. The, room. <laughs> the relationship is, he's the chairman of the, the Democratic Party, he's the Speaker of the House, the relationship is whatever just, we just show up. Do you enjoy up. support from him? <laughs> Uh, there is nobody supporting me that is going to have an effect on my views in this race. Or I do not know. He is not, he is not expressing that to me. I'm just explaining to you that I have a large number of people who are supporting me all across the state. I don't share all of their views, but I presume. I presume that they share. Right. Senator Vance, you did vote for the speaker when you were in the House of Representatives. I did, and that goes to the answer I gave. I'm from a different wing of the party than him, but I'm also a member of the Democratic Party, and I was the Democratic option for speaker, and I certainly wasn't going to pick a Republican. But I think that last answer was kind of, kind of indicative. Just admit it. Mad Madigan's for you. That's fine. That's all right. Why are we hiding about this? I don't think it's helpful to pretend. And you say you're an independent. Yeah, you were an independent in 2012 when you went to the trading floor and said you weren't sure if you were going to vote for Barack Obama for re-election because you have to wait and see who the Republicans nominated. But the question here is who is Mike Madigan for? And the answer is you. And that comes to the advantage and the disadvantage and we should all just be honest and direct about that. Mr. President. I, I, I do need to respond to that. Senator Biss, you ran Mike Madigan's pack last year. Here. We all are Democrats. We don't get to choose who the Speaker is. He is the Speaker of the House. There's nothing that any of us can do with it except to support leadership term limits, which I do. So, <laughs> I'm a proud Democrat. I'll say it again. There was an effort by a lot of Democrats, several of whom are on this stage, to fight against Donald Trump and Bruce Rauner in the fall of 2016, and you bet I took a leadership role in that effort. And when I'm governor, and Mike Madigan is speaker, I'm going to work with him to advance progressive solutions. The question is, are you from the same wing of the party as Mike Madigan or not? And all I know is that Mike Madigan has taken a position in this race, and people might like that and want to be for Madigan's candidate, or they might not like that and not want to be for Madigan's candidate, but let's just be honest about it. Mr. Kennedy, what's your relationship like with Speaker Madigan? I think we should give him a choice. I think he should have the choice between being a property tax appeals lawyer or a state representative. I don't think we have to accept the current situation. I don't think it has to be like this in Illinois. He's a property tax appeals lawyer. He's appealing the property taxes to Joe Barrios. One is head of the state Democratic Party, one's head of the Cook County Democratic Party. The scale of this thing is incredible. The Sears Tower sells for a billion, two hundred million dollars. It gets a billion dollar mortgage on it. They're reported at Cook County. They're reported in the Tribune and Cranes. The assessor, Joe Barrios, says, oh no, he has alternative facts. It's only worth five hundred and seventy-nine million dollars. We need, we need to prevent our elected officials from having outside jobs that are adverse to the interests of the body they were elected to serve. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Amazon. The Amazon sweepstakes. The mayor and the governor tomorrow are planning a pep rally. Wisconsin spent a pep rally to show their interest in receiving that second headquarters. Wisconsin spent three billion in public subsidies for Foxconn. How far should Illinois go? Are there any incentives you would oppose 
the state giving Amazon or a similar company? Mr. Harmon. Oh, yeah. I put a quote out about Amazon coming to Illinois in uh, the Capital Facts. Let's see, I'm totally against providing infrastructure funds to Amazon for coming here. And I'm also uh, basically I plan on giving Amazon a minimum tax break. And I also oppose giving them tax reimbursements once they get here. We need Amazon to build their headquarters number two over in Inglewood, over in the Austin community on the west side, or East St. Louis. You know, one of these distressed cities and towns out here. That's what we like for Amazon to build their second headquarters, my people. So I'm totally against providing any infrastructure money to Amazon. These Fortune 500 companies are making a lot of money. We need the jobs, yes, and the most important thing we can do here in Illinois is provide with the brilliant minds and the young, brilliant people here in Illinois. Mr. Decker, how far should Illinois go? I'm proud of the fact that I worked a year ago in August to bring Amazon to southwestern Illinois, where it's got one of its largest distribution centers in all of the Midwest. Over 1,500 jobs are there today, and I'm going to tell you, they came for three reasons. One, we did invest in infrastructure. Two, we did provide them with a readily trained workforce. And three, we expedited the permitting so they could open their doors within three months. And if you want Amazon to come here, that's what you're going to have to do. I, I want to bring it back to southwestern Illinois. I want them to expand in East St. Louis or on the Metro East side where they're close to their main distribution center. I think that's a big selling point. Secondly, I, I'd be open for them coming to Chicago. I, I want the jobs in Illinois. I don't want them to go to Wisconsin. I'm willing to do as governor whatever I have to do to bring business to Illinois. And you have to invest in order to attract. I will tell you that I've done it. I've worked on it for 20 years. Uh, one of the largest distribution centers in all of Illinois is at the intersection of 111 and 270. Drive through Southern Illinois and see it. Thank you. Mr. Pritzker, how far should Illinois go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Okay. If the benefits of a deal with Amazon do not inure to the benefit of the neighborhoods and of counties across the state of Illinois, it's not a good deal. Let's make sure that we are truly getting a payoff for the taxpayers. So whatever that benefit is that we give to try to bring the incentives, to try to bring companies to Illinois, which we should do, but you should only do it if it is truly inuring to the benefit of the taxpayers. And that means a real rate of return on the investment, the incentive that's being given. It's clear, though, that companies like Amazon in part have chosen Chicago and choosing Illinois because of work that I've done in building and founding 1871 to build up the technology infrastructure here in the city of Chicago and around the state of Illinois. It is important for us to have an ecosystem that fosters technology startups, and that's one of the very attractive features for Amazon thinking about Illinois. All right, thank you. Mr. Kennedy, what about Amazon? Is there a limit on what Illinois should give to Absolutely. Them? Absolutely. We should start by closing their tax advantage. They shouldn't be able to sell in the Cook County and not pay the taxes here collect and pay. It's a disadvantage for every retailer. Everybody who works in those stores now has shorter hours. The store owner has less revenue. The landlord gets less rent. The schools get less taxes. We're destroying our economy to accommodate a single company. This is no way to, to go about economic development in the United States. Giving out corporate welfare to bring people in to get in an auction. It's no way to elect a governor. It's no way to fund an economy. Senator Biss, could you respond? We have, we're getting down to the wire. We've got to move a little faster. OK, I'll try to be quick. First of all, you introduced this question by talking about Ron Emanuel and Bruce Brown are holding a pep rally together. So there's going to be a lot of nightmares tonight. <laughs> the question is, how much should we give Amazon? The answer is not much. The answer is, we need to look very, very, very closely at whatever they ask for and understand what they're going to be giving, not just uh, in terms of jobs downtown, but all of Illinois. And understand the benefit to people and communities that have been the victims of disinvestment, not just for a few years, but for decades. Make sure that we ask that question, but also know this. The tax system that we have that is rigged by millionaires and billionaires against the rest of us is mirrored on the corporate side, where it's rigged by giant corporations that can hire lobbyists and to get headlines in the newspaper against small businesses and entrepreneurs. And so if we keep on playing this race to the bottom game and shoveling money for the big corporations to get the headlines, we actually make Illinois less friendly to the kind of businesses that we want to see in order to have a thriving economy. Thank you. I'll
I have a problem with giving Amazon any money. See, the thing is, Amazon is a publicly traded company, so they have a legal responsibility to ask for as much as they can get. Government, on the other hand, has a different responsibility, which is not to report to shareholders, but to report to their constituents. Amazon has, is on the leading edge of automation. So they make things really cheap, but they put people out of work. Watch what's going to happen to Whole Foods. So what I've said is, look, look, if we can find $5 billion, $3 billion, $2 billion, whatever they're going to ask for, for Amazon, then match it with a, a new dollar, dollar for dollar, for public schools, or infrastructure, or economic development. If we can't find the money to match every dollar incentive that we offer them, then they shouldn't get it done. And the other thing we should know is that the jobs that Amazon is creating in those warehouses aren't good jobs at all. They're 1099 employees with no benefits that pay $14 an hour. That's crap. So let's stop giving money to companies that automate, take jobs out of our companies, and put people out of business. Mr. Gutierrez. We need to look at this as an investment potential in Illinois. You know, if Amazon's going to bring 50,000 jobs, we need to hold them to that. If they're going to bring 60, we need to hold them to that. We, do, we did a disservice in uh, Libertyville. Motorola said they were going to, Quinn signed a bill, we're going to give them five, they're going to sign up for 5,000 jobs. The next year they sold to Google, next year they sold to Lenovo, guess what happened to those jobs? They disappeared. And 55% of our college students do not go to college in this state. Imagine if we had a huge second corporate warehouse within Illinois. Kids would want to stay here. We have a mass migration issue. You, you can say that's with taxes, you can say it's because they're not getting social services. That's a big opportunity for us to keep and invest and grow. And let's be honest, Washington's their first headquarters. What's legal in Washington? They're going to feel right at home once we pass the legalization of cannabis right here in Illinois. All right, let's talk about a different issue, switching topics, police brutality. What's the role of the governor? What are your plans? And what, where do you stand when it comes to police demilitarization, de-escalation, retraining to protect Illinois citizens, particularly people of color? What role does the governor play in this issue? Mr. Harden. Okay, I'm going to take that one first. I'm the only candidate standing on this stage that stood up against police brutality here in Chicago and nationwide. Stood up when Laquan McDonald was executed, shot 16 times. Officer Jason Van Dyke tried to reload and shoot him another 16 times. I stood up to make sure that uh, Superintendent McCarthy got fired. A few other things happened. And as governor, I plan to really uh, set up a task force to address the issue of uh, the issue of police relations in communities of color. The police need a lot of de-escalation training. We need a lot of training, sensitivity training. So as a governor, I plan to lead that charge. The reality is that Mayor Ron Emanuel is the last man to Mayor Ron Emanuel. Mayor Ron Emanuel was involved in a cover-up from the floor up. And this needs to go. And as governor also, you know, I'm running for governor. I plan to make sure Mayor Ron Emanuel does not win the next election as well. But let me say this to everybody out here. Police officer, I got this from a seasoned police officer. He said police, when they're going through their training, for the first 90 days, they should not have a gun on them. They should get to know the people in the community. There's no evidence that dictates the fact that people are shooting at the police. So they should not be scared to go in communities of color and get to know the people. So as you go, I plan to lead that charge. governors can stand up to the mayor, can stand up to what we're seeing going on in Chicago and frankly around the state as well. I've seen the videos. I forced myself to watch them. I don't know what other videos might exist that they haven't shown us. I don't know what brutality exists that wasn't videoed. There is no faith in the police officers in our city here in Chicago from the community. That entire form of trust has broken down. We need to rebuild it with truth, with honesty, with candor, with accessibility. We need to strengthen Lori Lightfoot's committee, her role, give them teeth for enforcement. You can't have, if there's no transparency, then there can be no accountability. If there can be no accountability, there's no punishment. And the state of Illinois can come in and help with all of those. Thank you. Mr. Pritzker? So we need, we, we need transparency and we need accountability, and, that, and the governor can be responsible for that. 
because it is the data that gets collected on a county level, on a city level, that, that we need to enforce the collection of and make sure that we are evaluating it, I mean, all across the state. It's true that we've got the problem here in the city of Chicago, but it is also true across every county, 102 counties, this is an issue. So restoring transparency, accountability, bringing transparency and accountability, and then, very importantly, we need to require that there's tr true training. And I'm talking about use of force training, and I'm talking about cultural competency training to make sure that the police officers are, in fact, themselves beginning to rebuild trust with the community. You know that we have a real problem in this county, and that is that because the trust is lacking, we truly don't solve most of the crime that occurs because people in communities aren't willing to talk about it because they just don't trust the police. Alderman Pawar. Sit down, you're just another one of Ronald's puppet. All right, can we please have a discussion? If you want police accountability, you just know this. If the deal comes before city council that addresses the 13 reforms that Lori Lightfoot put out, I said I stood with the Black Caucus and we voted down. And likely will get voted down. But then he goes to binding arbitration. And no changes will take place. That's why the next governor has the lead on making sure that statewide these FOP contracts are addressed so that the proper standards are in place. Two, a statewide truth and reconciliation commission with reparations so that we're actually having a conversation about what's happened to communities not just today not just yesterday from a historical perspective three the governor has the power of commutation if i'm elected governor we will commute the sentences of low-level non-violent drug offenders and stop participating in a racist war on drugs <laughs> I'm glad that you mentioned in the question militarization of the police because I think it speaks to both a concrete problem but also the basic wrong direction we're going in here. The attitude of militarization and the enormously um, divisive mechanism of law enforcement and our broader criminal justice system is the whole problem here. So we of course have to build community policing and of course the state can enact laws that are very, very important when it comes to real accountability, when it comes to holding individuals accountable. By the way, there are still people incarcerated today who uh, were convicted because of torture-tainted testimony. So the commutation power of the governor can be very useful there as well, not just to do justice, but also to demonstrate the consequences that come from the exercise of brutality on the part of the police force. But then, beyond that, we need to actually do the kind of wholesale reinvestment in communities, a wholesale transformation of our criminal justice system that ensures that these issues are fundamentally about restoration and collaboration, not about attacks and militarization. All right, let's talk about the image of this constant Chicago versus the rest of the state. Some believe that Governor Romer's rhetoric has been toxic in this area. Uh, can you, as governor, change the perspective and create a unified message between Chicago and the rest of the cities? That it's not Chicago versus downstate. Superintendent Tiber, why don't you begin? Thank you. That's exactly why I'm running. Because I believe there's more that unites us than divides us. And I've said this through my campaign, that everybody in Illinois wants good schools, they want safe neighborhoods, and they want good paying jobs. And I will tell you, I'm the first person in 20 years that has stood up from Southern Illinois to run for governor because no one had the courage to do it, because they didn't think an everyday guy or someone from Southern Illinois could come to Chicago, be accepted, or even be listened to. So I decided to run to shrink the polarization of the state, to unite the state, to give everyone hope again in this state that as a state we can progress forward, we can move forward as one state, not a state that's divided by a Chicago bailout like was talked about for education. I was the first to say there is no bailout. It's for all of Illinois. We all need things and we all need to strive for the best of what's the good for all the state. As governor, I can bring that unity together. Mr. Paterikas, how, how will you create a more unified state rather than Chicago versus the rest? State, look at the city of Chicago, we don't unified Chicago. The west and the south suburbs don't get the investment from Rahm Emanuel. 
But look at what we have right now. Peoria was surrounded by everything Caterpillar. We gave them a tax cut. We said Caterpillar's gonna build a billion dollar headquarters. New CEO comes in, we're gonna move everyone up to Chicago. Runner goes into that town, he's gonna win that town because he can champion on that fact that look at they're moving jobs from your communities into the city of Chicago. And we don't speak enough to the citizens of downstate. We don't tell them that they can be something and they see all their family members moving because we don't invest in them. That's what you need to do in Chicago too. If you give money to the communities to invest, let the communities decide what that money goes towards. Right now we have politicians just dictate where the money goes, but we need the communities to have the funds to be able to invest in what they need, not what the city of Chicago or Cook County needs. I don't say quite a lot during this campaign, um, and in fact, I think I've been to a majority of the counties already. Um, it's important to point out that the challenges that people face all across the state of Illinois outside of Cook County and the Collars are frankly many of the same challenges that we are talking about here in Cook County. There are challenges around job creation, around making our education system better, and of course around expanding healthcare availability. Because under Bruce Cover, we know that two years and six days without a budget frankly just decimated social services across the state and jobs too and of course our education system. So everybody's talking about the same things and we need to bring the state together. That is why the, I put, put forward a plan to, in each of those areas to address jobs, education, and healthcare, not just in uh, downstate or southern Illinois and central Illinois, right here in Cook County and across the collars. It's important for us to be expansive in our thinking, but we are one state. We are one state and we cannot have a governor who is dividing the state. Okay, we have a couple of other questions we're trying to squeeze in. Like to know where you stand on, will you, community of this room, these are folks asking this question here in the room, to oppose any more school closings? Alderman Kowar. So I see schools closing my ward. And what I said in 2013 is what I'm saying today. Closing a school is akin to closing a community. And when you close a school in the most struggling communities, you're often re removing the last bit of government dollars that comes into that community. So how do you expect the community to thrive if you close the most basic building block of that community? And that's why I believe we need a moratorium to close any more schools. And most, more importantly, not only do we need a moratorium on school closures, but if there's a conversation about closing more schools, then that has to be done by a democratically elected school board. Because having one person appoint the school board who then makes decisions for the rest of us is how we get to a place where we have myopic people running our school system. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy, where do you stand on the closing of schools? I'd stop, I'd stop the school closings. I know when I was running the Merchandise Mart, the Apparel Mart, they weren't always performing it super high levels, but we didn't close them, we fixed them. Sheila and I, we've lived in the same community for 25 years. You wanted to get us to move? Three things you could do. Close our local school, decrease the number of police so crime goes up, threaten our local hospital, and if you want to guarantee that we move, get rid of the grocery store so we end up in a food desert. You do those four things, we're out of there. The government could do that to the Kennedys. The government could do it to anybody. That's what's going on in this city. The city's becoming smaller, and it's becoming white. This is absolute strategic gentrification. We're becoming like Paris, pushing the poor and the minorities to the suburbs, and leaving the core inner city for the white rich people. My children go to second and fourth grade in our neighborhood public school, and it's the anchor of our neighborhood in every way, in every way. I can't believe that Rahm Emanuel is talking about closing schools again. It's unconscionable, unopposed it, and we all have to stand together and fight against it because there is an effective operation on the other side. So we have to be clear about that. But we also need an elected school board because that's the right way to bring democracy into this process. Right now, we're going to have to do a big mass movement to persuade 
decision makers who aren't really accountable to us to finally just do the right thing. Instead of getting elected school board, it'd be much quicker. That's why I voted for elected school board bill that, that we are in the process of passing in Springfield. I'm not too confident about Bruce Rauner's signature. When I'm governor, I'm going to sign that bill. All right, a couple of questions, just to show of hands before your final comments. And strengthening the gun control legislation in Illinois. Show of hands, yes or no? Thank you. Do you support making Illinois a sanctuary state? Yes or no? Yes. Find up behind the Democratic nominee for governor, whoever, whomever that may be. Do you all agree? Thank you. All right, I think it's time to come to the Let's start this way, let's start that way. Mr. Pateri's hunt should begin. We don't lead in anything in Illinois. The only thing we lead in is debt, migration, and failed governors. Okay. The cannabis industry has been put down considerably, and it's been a disservice. We need to lead with legalization of cannabis, but also invest in our farmers and hemp production. You want to be an ecologically stable uh, state? Use hemp production for plastics and other things. And it's investment in our farmers too. And make sure when we do legalize cannabis, that corporate farms not infiltrate the way that they've done every single every single other product uh, in Illinois. This state needs true leadership. You've been promised a lot of things there, and I hope that people maintain those promises. But if history teaches us anything, it doesn't. So it's up to you, all of you, to hold every one of us accountable. My name is Alex Paterakis. Thank you again, Warren Sanders 2020. I want to thank everyone for being here today. Sharon, thanks for letting me do this. As I said, this, this election is about race and class because I'm watching politicians at the national and state level pit poor white people against poor black and brown people. And the best way to talk about this is our racist past with the war on drugs. This is all comes down to economics. 40 years ago when jobs were leaving black and brown communities from the inner cities, we didn't provide investment, we had poverty rates go up, people were struggling, and instead, what we, instead of providing investment, we created a racist war on drugs, and we broke up black and brown families. And now today, those same kinds of jobs are leaving poor white communities, company towns, river towns. The same issues have come up, but the drugs are different. It's not cracking cocaine from 40 years. And today we call it a public health crisis. Stop dividing ourselves based on race and class and geography and recognize that poor white people, poor black people, poor brown people have all the same issues. And stop letting Trump and Romney use their racist tactics to divide us. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I just stood up for progressive democratic values. My back. Marching long before a women's march, long before uh, the gay pride parade in, in Chicago this year, we're talking 25 years ago when it wasn't a gay pride parade, when in fact it was a protest. When it was a protest march, when it was called the Illinois Federation for Human Rights before Equality Illinois, um, hosting a gay wedding at my home because it was the right thing to do. It may not have been legal, but it was the right thing to do. Um, and you know that um, I have been engaged in standing up for people all across the state, particularly the, our youngest, most at-risk kids. We need universal preschool in this state. We need universal child care in this state. I've been working toward that. There are thousands of kids who get that now in the state because of the work that I've done. The 230,000 kids who get school breakfast, at-risk kids in low-income communities, the tens of thousands of kids who learn to fight bigotry and hatred and intolerance, and I created 1871 and more than 7,000 jobs. Those are big things that I've gotten accomplished, and the, the, those big things that I've gotten accomplished are evidence that I can do the job in Springfield for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This separates Democrats from Republicans. Because the Democrats believe that government can be a force of good. It can be an ally, an agent of change can educate our kids, take care of our disabled brothers and sisters, keep our communities safe, take care of our elderly parents, and invest in the economy, but more importantly, 
in the people that that economy is meant to serve. Too many Democrats have been alienated from our party. We'll never be able to get them back. We'll never be able to reach across the aisle of Republicans. We'll never be able to get independents to join us if our party remains corrupt, if our leadership remains compromised if we allow our senior leadership to continue to have jobs as property tax appeals lawyers and the corruption, get the dirty money out of politics, get the dirty politicians out of government. Thank you. And again, thank you everyone for being here. I'll end where I started. This is a really, really important election. And there was a lot that happened here that I think kind of tried to blur some of the distinctions and maybe make us feel as though it's actually not that big a deal. And I'm glad that now in 2017, we have consensus on some of the issues that we didn't have consensus on until super recently. $15 minimum wage, progressive income tax. I'm glad that most people on this stage support some version of single payer health care somehow, but the question we ought to be asking ourselves is who has been fighting this fight and who is going to get it done? When I've been moving forward to try to advance a progressive income tax in the state of Illinois for a decade, we could have used $21 million to help us with that battle, but those $21 million weren't there. The question before us is who is ready to build the movement we need to enact transformational progressive change. I am that candidate. I'm here asking for your support and asking to join in your movement because we need to have an election and not an auction. I'm running for governor because I would like to represent all the poor, working class, and better. Anything else, my run for governor is a wake up call. Black, the black vote is a hustle, and black death is a hustle across Illinois, definitely in Chicago. We need to take a look at who we're going to vote for in this election. I have a 2020 plan which represents a perfect vision. I won 30 counties downstate in 2014. I have a countywide presence, statewide presence. I plan to represent everybody. We have 1.7 million people living in poverty in Illinois right now. 30% of people of color, and we also have an uh, issue with 900,000 people that are not insured in Illinois right now. So I plan to represent the veterans, everybody, the college students, you know, the senior citizens, the ex-offender community, the recovery community. I'm one of the only real progressive candidates on this stage today. I was born a progressive Democrat and a revolutionary for this state. I need your support to take on all the big money candidates and make history by defeating all the big money. That's my words for Thank you. There's been a lot said today, but I'm going to tell you something that's very important. Billion dollars of unpaid bills, and you and I and everybody else paid $10 million a day interest. I said as governor, my first matter of business will pay those bills down because that's the right thing to do. I'll bond them out. I'll put the debt interest in my manual budget, and I'll move the state forward. Until we do that, we can't do nothing but go deeper in debt as a state. Period. Secondly, I said I would strengthen unions. On March 21st, I signed a pledge. I said no to right to work in Illinois. I said Illinois will not be like Wisconsin. It will not be like Indiana. It will not be like Missouri. But it will rise above. It will have good wages. It will be a place where working families, again, can be proud to be middle class. I also said this, that if you want a governor who can put the experience, Governing is an art. It's how you get along with Mike Madigan. It's how you get along with all the members of the General Assembly. I've done it for 22 years, and I'll do it as your next governor. Thank you for having me. It was fun, Mary Ann. Thank you for your good work today. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone else. If you would please stand up and face the cameras. Let's all give a loud round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the 50 plus organizations uh, that sponsored this forum. Uh, Mary Ann will close, but I just wanted to declare my thanks to everybody. Thank you to the team of volunteers that led this, uh, led by Ahmed Khan. Uh, and visit our website, ourrevolutionil.com, to get involved with more information. Thank you, Mary Thank you. Thank you.